glad to be here in worship today. Amen. Let's pray, let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you for this day and uh, for this opportunity we have to come and, and to worship you. And Lord, we remember today those that paid a price that made it possible for us to be here. We thank you for our freedom, uh, for the opportunity we have to come and to worship you uh, for who you are, our great God. And we pray today, God, that you would bless us today as we worship. Spirit of God, speak to our hearts. Uh, do the work in us that needs to be accomplished today. And we thank you, God, in advance for all that you'll do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome. It's uh, Memorial Day weekend, and uh, we have a lot of folks that are out of town on the road uh, today, but we are glad that you're here because today is going to be a great day uh, because um, we're going to put one on the devil this morning before we get out of here. And so uh, I've been praying all week about today and, and getting ready, and so we're glad that you're here. Right now what I want you to do is uh, look around and find somebody you may not recognize, okay? And, uh, and just uh, speak a word of welcome to them. Uh, do that right now. Let's be seated together. We are so grateful that the Lord above works in our lives, and we're so thankful in our preschool to have our youngest baby attending uh, here with his parents this morning. I think uh, most of you know Linda and Glenn Canna. Uh, we're so thankful that both sets of grandparents are able to be here uh, today for this special occasion. This little young man is named Alistair Bill, and he was just born this past March, and Alistair is such a joy to us here in our preschool. Ms. Winnie will present a gift to them that we give to all of our uh, new parents each time a baby comes. That includes um, a Jesus Storybook Bible for Alistair. We have um, a, a, a James Dobson's book on raising boys for Glenn and Linda. And um, I, I indulged and bought Glenn a second book on devotionals for dads, so I hope I won't get in trouble for that. And then we do have, um, we do have letters uh, for the parents and for Alistair as he grows up that are from the pastor. And um, I just know that he's going to be a great blessing here for all of our church along with all of our other young babies. You know, when we, uh, when we found out that Glenn and Linda were expecting, it was an exciting time. Uh, first of all, uh, because they were actually going to finally have a kid. And then when it was born, the double blessing was it looks like Linda. So we're thanking God for that, okay? Uh, the other thing is Glenn in that book, Raising Boys, it talks about the fact that they have to wear camouflage, okay? And so uh, Glenn says he's not going to wear camouflage. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. But, you know, I was thinking about today, and I was thinking about this time that we have together, and my mind went back to the book of Deuteronomy. And um, uh, listen to what the Bible has to say. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your soul and with all of your might. These words I am commanding to you today, they shall be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, 
and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlet on your forehead and you shall write them on the doorpost of your home and on your gates. You know, uh, one thing I, I'd say to, to Glenn and Linda is this. Boy, what a great challenge to raise children in this world. Uh, it is a way different world that, than you grew up in. It's for sure different from the world I grew up in. But it's, it's way different, and there's all kind of challenges. And you'll never go wrong as long as you just sow, you sow godly principles and you sow God's Word uh, into Alistair's life. And so uh, our challenge to you today is to, is to stay before God and to seek Him and to love Him with all of your heart and with all of your might and to set that example for your, for your son. You know, as a church, we, we, we have responsibilities to, to come alongside of couples like these. I mean, uh, so many of us, our children are, are grown and, uh, and, and we can come alongside and we can share wisdom and insight and encouragement with uh, young families like Glenn and Linda, but also we pray for them and we encourage them uh, in, these, in these really challenging and trying days that we live in. Let, let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for this family. We thank you for Alistair. God, I thank you for the plan that you have for his life. Uh, Lord, that you've purposed and uh, you've ordered his steps. And, and we pray, Father, that your perfect will would be accomplished in him. We pray for, for Linda and for Glenn. And Lord, that you would use them in his life uh, to sow your word and your principles and, and to set a godly example for him. And as a church, we pray that we're found faithful, doing the things that we need to do, encouraging, supporting, coming alongside, helping in any way that we can. And we pray for the day that Alistair will trust Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And so, Spirit of God, we pray that you'd even now begin to work in his life and begin to temper him and to make him be receptive to that time when you'll draw him to yourself. We thank you for them. We thank you for their ministry here. We thank you for the work that they do. And we thank you for this precious gift that they've received. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the canops a hand. Let's stand and worship. Let's enter in to the presence of the Lord as we sing our songs to you, Lord. We bring our hearts. We bring our lives. We come as we are. We want to experience you in your fullness today. Bless us and descend on us, we pray. Amen. Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame, all because of your love. Maker of the universe, broken for the sins of the earth, all because of your love. Sing it out. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Because of your love, because of your
praise the Lord. As we honor our, our fallen and those that made such an incredible sacrifice, we'd be mistaken not to think about our Lord and Savior who gave the ultimate sacrifice for us, that we may have eternal life. sing this hymn together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me
Anybody here want to praise the Lord today? Come on. Give him glory today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's be seated together. Well, if you bought your Bible, um, be finding the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter number 7. Uh, for several weeks now, we've been talking about spiritual battles, how to persevere, how to stand, how to win. And uh, today I want to talk about what does it take to defeat the enemy? The Bible says we're involved in a spiritual battle. Uh, the Bible says that every day we put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the wiles of the devil. The thing that's important is to remember that 
we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So how do we win the battle? How do we defeat, how do we overcome uh, the war that we're involved in every day of our lives? Well, Joshua, the seventh chapter, gives us some insight into this. And right now I'd like us to look at verses 10 through 12 to kind of set the stage. And today I want to share with you three principles, three things that you can take right here, right now, today, and plug into your life that will help you today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now, to overcome and to defeat our enemy. Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 10. Stand with me as uh, we give honor to God's Word. So the Lord said to Joshua, Rise up. Why is it that you've fallen on your face? Israel have sinned, and they've also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they've even taken some of the things under the ban, and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they've also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they've been accursed. I will not be with you any more unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Now, Father, today we understand that, that we are in a battle. And I know that this morning there'll be a battle. There'll be a battle for our mind. There'll be a battle for our attention. And Lord, I pray today that, that your spirit would do the work in our lives that needs to be done. Give us ears to hear what you have to say to us today. Give us hearts that are receptive to your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Um, author William Seymour makes an insightful observation in his book, Decisive Factors in 20 Great Battles of the World, that I really believe help us to study how to become a first-class soldier in the Lord's army. You know, when we were kids, we used to sing that song, I'm in the Lord's army. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, zoom or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. You remember that song? We used to sing it. You younger people may not. It's just for us older ones, okay? Uh, but we did. We used to sing that, and we had all kind of gestures and hand motions and, and everything that we'd go through. But listen to what Seymour says. He talks about tactics uh, in this book. And he says, Due to changes in weapons over the centuries, and the science of war will change with time, but the underlying principles remain constant, and were, a vital, and were as vital in battles fought in ancient days as those fought in the 20th century. In other words, what he's saying is that, that, that there are some principles regarding war that are true for all times, and, and basically says, if we ignore them, we ignore them to our peril. And so if we're going to be successful in this, this battle, this war against the devil... If we're going to walk in victory, if we're going to help others to walk in victory, uh, then we must learn these principles that we're going to talk about today, and we've got to follow these things. You know, so many times in talking with people, I hear people th say things like this. Well, I know, I know, I know what I need to do. I know what I ought to do. I know what I want to do. But I just can't seem to do it. You ever been there? Yes, sir. You know what you want to do? You know what you need to do? Uh, you know what God wants you to do? But in our, in our being, in our spirit, we have a hard time just doing it. Well, this morning I'm praying that, that God, through the Holy Spirit, will speak to our hearts and he'll bring us to the point this morning to where we can actually do it. Real simple. 
How do you defeat the devil? How do you win the battle for your mind? How do you win, win the battle for your life? How do you win the battle for your family? How do you win the spiritual battles and the spiritual struggles that you're involved in? Three things. Number one, real simple. We must abstain from sin. You see, realizing that, that you are in God's army is critical to, to your success in fighting this huge spiritual battle. And, and if we're going to be successful in the battle, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to cut off the enemy's supply line. And there's a great example of this in the Word of God when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, invaded uh, Judah. And notice in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 uh, that King Hezekiah's response as he receives word that Sennacherib is approaching Jerusalem. Verse number 2, it says, Now when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, he decided with his officers and his warriors to cut off the supply of water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. So many people assembled and they stopped up the springs and the stream which flowed through the region saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find abundant water? And he took courage and he rebuilt all the wall that had been broken down and he erected towers on it. And he built another outside the wall to strengthen uh, the Milo of the city of David. You see, when Hezekiah found out that the enemy was approaching, notice what he did. The very first thing he did was that he identified the areas that they were vulnerable. Where is our vulnerability? Where are we weak? Where are we ripe for an attack? And so he looked at those areas that Sennacherib might seize on. And in this case, fresh waters and walls that had been broken down. And so he begins to make the proper Adjustments. You know, in, in natural war, vulnerable areas can include all kinds of things. I mean, it could be food, it could be water, it could be utilities, it could be uh, transportation, it could be communication. I mean, we sit in our living rooms and we watch Fox News on television and we watch war taking place on the other side of the world. And one of the first things we do is we get superiority of the air and we take out communications because we know that if we have the air and we take out communications that everything shifts in our favor. And so you've got to determine what those vulnerable areas are. Well, in the spiritual battles, one of the things that makes us most vulnerable to the enemy is sin. Sin, listen to me now, separates us from God in the sense that it cuts us off from His power. Uh, sometimes people say, well, I just don't sense the power of God at work in my life. I just don't sense the presence of God at work in my life. I just don't feel like the Spirit of God is at work in my life. Well, one of the things that sin does is it cuts off the power of God. Sin interrupts what God is trying to do in your life. And the reason for that is God is holy and God cannot dwell with unholiness. You see, Moses warned the Israelites about this very thing as they're getting ready to enter into the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 23. I like the way the Amplified Bible puts it. And when you go forth against your enemies and are in camp, you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore your camp shall be holy that he may see nothing indecent among you and turn or retreat from you. You see, if you want to have the presence of God's power, and you want God to manifest Himself through you, then holiness, living a holy and a pure life, has got to be a priority with you. It's got to be at the top of your prior list. You see, that kind of life, let me tell you what it comes from. It comes from reading and meditating on the Word of God, but then there's another step that we leave out. Walking it out, living it out in our lives. I mean, think about all the Bible studies you've been to. Think about all the sermons you've heard. Think about all the books that you've read. 
and, and we live in the information age, and, and we are in information overload. I mean, every day of our life, we are inundated with information, 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 information. The same thing is true in the church. We have Bible studies for this and Bible studies for that and, and special services for this and special emphasis for that and this program and that program and this ministry and that ministry and all of this information about spiritual living and being victorious in our Christian walk is bombarding us from every angle and we know and we've heard it. But the challenge comes in what? Walking it out. Living it out. Putting feet on what we've been taught. Putting feet on what we've learned. Putting feet on what we've studied. Holy living has got to be a part of it if we're going to have victory. Because you see, harboring sin in your life, let me tell you what it is. It is an open invitation to the devil. You know what he does? It gives him permission to step in and to do whatever he wants to do in your circumstances. And until we repent of that sin, we're powerless to resist him. I know what you're wondering. Well, does my, does my sin as a, as a teenager matter? I mean, does it matter? I mean, does my sin matter in my family? Uh, does my sin matter to my church? Well, let me tell you a story. The children of Israel had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses dies. God raises Joshua up. Joshua takes the children of Israel and they cross over into the promised land, the land that was promised to them, the land that flows with milk and honey. But there were challenges in the land. There were fortified cities in the land. There were giants in the land. But God made them a promise. Every step you take, I've already given to you. Just take the land. And so they cross over into the Jordan, over the Jordan. They cross over into the promised land. And as they cross into the, into the promised land, I mean, just like God said, just like God is true, just like God is just, he kept his word. And so they went and they came up against Jericho, the greatest city in the land. Walls that were massive, enormous, impenetrable walls. And God said, I tell you what you do. You march around the, the walls of the city one time a day for six days. And on the seventh time, day, you march around seven times. And after the seventh time around, you shout and let a trumpet blast and the walls will come down. They took Jericho. Word began to spread throughout the land. I'm sure that, that the, the children of Israel are coming and they came up against Ai. Ai was not a big place. It was not a fortified place. And, and the children of Israel decided, you know what, uh, we just send about 3,000 men up there. We'll take care of this and we'll move on into the land. There's only one problem. When they went up against Ai, they were driven back. They lost men, they experienced defeat. Joshua comes and, and he falls on his face before God and he's crying out to God, how did this happen? How in the world did this happen? You promised and it happened. And God says, what are you doing on your face before me? Uh, you got a problem. And the problem is there's sin in the camp. Aiken had kept some of the spoils. All the spoils that were taken were, were put into a, pro, a common treasury. But Achan, as, 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 they were, as they were getting the things together, he saw some things that appealed to him, some things that didn't belong to him. And he took them to his house and he hid them in his tent and he told his family, don't tell anybody. They'll never miss this. This is insignificant. This is unimportant in the scheme of things, but we'll have this here to be our college slush fund for you guys when you graduate. It'll be to pay for the weddings that are coming down the road. Uh, uh, we'll build a house one day with this. Nobody knew about it except Aiken and his family, right? No, God knew about it. God knew about it. 
And because of that, Joshua gets up from the ground and, and, they, and they begin a search, they begin an inquiry, and, and, and they finally get down to Achan and, and, they, and they talk to Achan and Achan finally com confesses to what he's done and, and he goes and, and they find the, the things that are hidden in his tent and they bring them out and the Bible says that they took Achan, they took his wife, they took his children, they took his donkeys, they took his camels, they took everything that belonged to him and they stoned them, they killed them. They did away with the accursed thing that was in their midst. So the message is pretty clear. Harboring sin in your life makes it impossible for us to stand against the enemy. You see, there, there are some Christians that have convinced themselves, my sin doesn't matter. I mean, what I do really doesn't matter. I, I'm, I'm a, you know, we got 3,000 members of that church. My sin doesn't matter. We've convinced ourselves that I, my sin doesn't affect my family, that, that my sin doesn't affect my church, that, that it doesn't affect anyone but me. Oh, but it does. You see, when you're involved in things that don't honor God, it affects others. When you're involved in activities, you're involved in conversations that don't honor God, it affects others. Uh, when you do things that you shouldn't with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, it affects others. Uh, when your attitude doesn't honor Christ, it affects others. Uh, when you don't honor your father and your mother, it affects others. And you've got to understand that the only thing that will fix a sin problem is repentance. Let me tell you something, you can pray till you're blue in the face, but unless you come to the place of repenting, it's not going to fix it. Praying isn't going to fix it unless you're repenting before God. Fasting, you can fast until you wither away and there's nothing less. It's not going to fix your sin problem. Uh, giving a special offering, giving your money won't fix it. Uh, growing uh, or going to church isn't going to fix it. You can yell at the devil, it won't fix it. Uh, only repentance fixes a sin problem. After the defeated Ai, we see that Joshua is on his face and he's crying out to God about how bad things are. God, do you know how bad it is? I mean, do you realize who Joshua's talking? He's talking to God. And what happens? God basically says to Joshua, you know what, you, get up. What are you doing on your face? You're wasting your time. I'm not listening to you right now. You see, he didn't need to cry. He didn't need to whine. He didn't need to fast. He didn't need to pray for a week. The problem was sin, and Joshua needed to find out where it was and get rid of it. This may be the most important thing I say all day. So listen to every word that's coming off of my mouth right now. If you are harboring sin in your life, you, not God, not the devil, not other people, you have obstructed the flow of God's power and God's blessing to you. Do you know that no one can affect the blessing and the power of God in your life except you? People can talk about you. They can mistreat you. Uh, they can misrepresent you. They can slander you. They can do whatever they want to do to you. But you're the only person that affects the power and the blessing of God upon your life. And so if you're at a point right now, it's not your circumstances. It is you. There is something there with you. And the plain truth is that it's not going to get any better until you get rid of the sin in your life. You know, we've been praying for revival around here for... I don't know, at least three or four years now. Do you know that revival has never come until there has been wholesale 
repentance. That means Lee coming to the end of himself and saying, God, you know, it's me. It's me. It's not these people, Lord. It's me standing in the need of prayer. And churches say, oh, we need revival. We need revival. We need renewal. We need renewal. We need refreshing. We need a fresh wind from somewhere. And we know what we need to do, but we just don't do it. How long has it been since you repented? Second thing, sin must become an anomaly, not the norm. Look at uh, verse number 12. God didn't say, look, because you've sinned, I'm not going to be with you anymore. That's not what he said. Uh, look at it closely. He says, I'm not going to be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. You see, it's not that God wants to break fellowship with us when we sin. It's not that He wants to. It's that He has to. Light cannot fellowship with darkness. We can't have the lights on in this room and it be dark all at the same time. And so God is light. In Him, the Bible says, there is how much darkness? There is no darkness at all. And so God does not fellowship with darkness because darkness can't stand light. And so light cannot fellowship with darkness. But here's the thing. God is eager to resume fellowship with us as soon as we get back in a right relationship with Him. And the way we get back in a right relationship with Him is through repenting. And repenting, listen, it's not just feeling sorry about sin. You know you can be sorry about your sin and never repent? I mean, we may be sorry about our sin. We may be sorry we got caught. Or we may be sorry about our sin. We may be sorry for what we do, and we know it's sin, but we never come to the place of repenting of our sin. God doesn't say be sorry for your sin. He says repent of your sin. Repentance is not feeling sorry. Repentance is turning around and going in the opposite direction. In other words, when we repent, we stop sinning. And we start obeying God. Now, don't misunderstand. The Bible makes it clear in, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that, that we are saved by grace, not by works. And so we don't earn salvation through, a, 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 through obedience. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that only the blood of Jesus can atone for our sins and put us in a right standing with God. But that doesn't mean that obedience isn't important. What is obedience? You ever thought about that? Here it is right here. Obedience is the evidence that our salvation is genuine. Wow. Obedience is the evidence that our salvation is, is genuine. In other words, if we live in a constant state of disobedience, in other words, well, I walked the aisle when I was six years old and I gave my life to Jesus and I was baptized and, and I came up in the church, but if, if sin is a part of our life and sin doesn't bother us and sin doesn't affect us in any way, and if we have no regard in our mind for what we do in our disobedience... We might need to look at how genuine our experience was. You say, what, does that mean we never make mistakes? No, we're going to make mistakes. And God made provision of that in 1 John 1, 9. If, we're, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. I, I don't know, I read that again this morning and I thought, man, what an awesome, incredible amazing thing that if I confess my sin, that He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all of my unrighteousness. 
But here's the thing. We need to make sure that we don't allow that blessing to become an excuse for continuing a sinful lifestyle. In other words, you can't approach your life and say, well, I'm going to do it anyhow. God will forgive me. That's not, what, that's not what he's talking about there. And the truth is, if we've grown comfortable with sin as a believer, something's wrong. If you're living in sin and the Holy Spirit is not dealing with you, if he's not walking your log, if he's not yanking your chain, if he's not convicting you, if he's not dealing with you, if you can just sin and there's nothing bothering you and you're comfortable with your sin, you might want to give your heart to Jesus today. That's the norm before we come to Christ, that we're comfortable with it. For us, sin should be the exception, not the rule. And then the third thing is this. We, we, we must be above suspicion. A, a number of years ago, there was a television show called The, the Untouchables. Anybody remember that show? You ever watch that? Uh, it, it was a show that was, the whole plot was, was geared and built around the Capone era and the gangsters and everything like that. And, and there was rampant corruption in the law enforcement. Uh, and people were being bribed and being bought and, and everything like this. But, but this group of law enforcement agents came to be regarded as the untouchables. And, and basically they... they, they, they they were morally clean. They couldn't be bought. They couldn't be corrupted. Uh, there was nothing in them that gave the enemies access into their lives. Uh, you could say that Jesus was that way. He was untouchable. Uh, he even talked about it during some of the last moments he spent with his disciples. Look at John chapter 14, verse 30. He says, I will not speak much more with you, for the rule of the world is coming and he is, has nothing in me. In other words, there's nothing that he has on him. Look at the way the Amplified Bible reads. I will not talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius ruler of this world is coming. And he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. Therefore, he is nothing in, there is nothing in me that belongs to him. And he has no power over me me. You see, Jesus, you know what he's saying? I never left the door open for the devil. I never left the door open. Didn't go there. And as a result, the devil has no authority over him. The devil has no legal point of entry into his life. And what it boils down to is we've got to settle the matter in our hearts once and for all. Sin is like a magnet to the devil. He's attracted to it. He's drawn to it. And I think if you'll, if you'll be honest with yourself before God this morning, when we allow sin to stay in our life, it's like we leave the door cracked. We don't shut the door. Most affairs happen that way, is that the door is left ajar. The, Lord, the door is never closed, that the door is left cracked open and, and, and we really haven't shut the door on the matter. Most sins in our life that we battle against are that way. We don't shut the door and we give him legitimate access into our lives. And as long as we all harbor that sin and, and we keep playing around with it, we're not going to be able to exercise any real spiritual authority over him. And the reason is our sin has given him a legal right to be there. When's the last time 
that you came before God in prayer. And you knew when you went there that there was unconfessed sin in your life. Light doesn't fellowship with darkness. God just said to Joshua, get up off your face. What are you whining for? What are you complaining about? There's sin in the camp. Go deal with it. And they did. You see, it gives us something in common, the devil, when we sin. It attracts him to us. It gives him a legitimate access into our lives. And the reason is our sin basically gives him the legal right to be there. In fact, um, you could even say that, that he's there at our invitation. A lot of times we whine about being under spiritual attack. Well, the devil's after me. The devil's attacking me. And that, and that does happen sometimes. But whenever you come to that place, a good thing to do is take a step back and, 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 not, and don't whine or don't complain that you're being attacked by the devil uh, to, to do a self-inspection. Say, look, if I left the door open in any area of my life, have I left it ajar? Have, have I let him in the back door? Have I given him access through this area? And just as we saw earlier with Hezekiah, you may need to take a look around and see if there's anything in your life that is leaving you vulnerable. That's right. That's right. Have you left the door open in any area of your life? Is it a jar? Have you given the enemy the knife to stab you in the back? Have you given him the bullet to shoot you with in the spiritual battle of life? If so, you got to cut off the supply line. You got to close that door. You've got to repent of that sin. You've got to make the adjustments. You've got to start living the kind of life that will enable you to say, the devil has nothing on me. <coughs> He's got nothing on me because the doors are closed, the lines have been cut, there's nothing to impede what God wants to do in my life. <clears throat> For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Father, today I pray, Lord, that you'll have your way in our hearts and our lives. God, move in our church. Move in our lives. Change us Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You know, we talk about God moving. You know, we look at God moving all around the world today. We hear about churches that God is just settled on and moving.
God's no respecter of place or person. He can do it here. Others of us are here today. How long has it been? since you repented. How long has it been since God moved in and through you? How long has it been since God spoke to you? We're going to stand and sing here in just a moment. And as we sing, this altar's open. You can come and pray. Bobby and Rob are here. If you've never given your life to Jesus, you can come this morning and give your heart and your life to Christ. There's others that maybe you want to join this church and be a part of this fellowship. You can come. You can join and be a part of what God's doing here. So Lord, have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. to the sky. Well, amen. amen. I just challenge you to kind of chew on this this week a little bit. You're alone. You know, say, God, just do a spiritual MRI of me. You know, where am I? What do I need to do? 
You know, is there anything in my life that would inhibit what you want to accomplish through me? Amen. I'm telling y'all, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's really not. It's just uh, getting to the point of doing it. Well, it's time to give. Amen. And so uh, let's pray together. Yeah, Father, thank you. For your provision, you are faithful and just to provide. And we pray today, God, that as we, uh, as we give, Lord, you'll see our, our faithfulness, our gratitude, our obedience, our deep appreciation and love for you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When they said your unit was being deployed, I didn't picture anything like this. But I guess if we're sending heroes overseas, we might as well send the best. The house is going to seem so empty without you. You know what your son asked me this morning? He asked if we're still a family without Daddy here. I said yes, because he's always right here. I'm so proud of you. I'm glad America has heroes to send. It's just really hard giving up mine. I love you. Somebody died for me. said that he died so that America could be free. I hope America likes what my dad did for them because I really miss him. My mom says when I get to heaven, my dad will be there to meet us. I can't wait. Your friend, Brandon. P.S. Can you give my dad a big hug? He really likes that. So oh. 